Well, good evening. We'd like to welcome you uh, to our Sunday evening service, and uh, uh, we're going to continue in the uh, First Peter series. And tonight's uh, message I'd like to entitle uh, "Living Differently." And so, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to First Peter chapter one. Uh, we're going to read verses thirteen through seventeen. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy." And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, for the privilege that you've given us to be here tonight. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would anoint this word. We ask, Lord, that you would open the ears of the hearer, that you prepare the hearts of those that would receive this word. We ask, Lord, that you would speak clearly. And we pray, Lord, that your will would be done. Lord, we, we love this people, Lord, and we miss them desperately, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you would uh, uh, bring all things according to your will and your glory. We ask that this would be a blessing to you and to your people. And we ask all of this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Well, hello, Cabaret Church. Welcome back to our Sunday night service. Um, welcome to the Cowan Back Porch. I wish you could see the view that we see from our back porch. God's given us a great day today, and we're going to focus on holiness tonight as we dive back into the book of 1 Peter with Brother Chris, and uh, we're going to start with a reading in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 2, verse 2. It says, there is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Isaiah 57, verse 15 says, for thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. And so we ask for God to revive our hearts tonight. So let's sing together. Stand and lift up our hands. We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. Together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled. our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. Together we sing. Everyone sing. God Almighty, 
Well, some of you might not know this. Um, today is my mother's birthday, and um, I can't help but think of uh, just the things that she taught me through the years. And a lot of those sayings are encompassed in the songs that she's written. And um, I think I've done this once before. Um, this song is called uh, Without His Story, There Be No Hope For Me. Is that right? Anyway, this is, uh, this is her song. He was born in a stable so that all may be sure. He was born to be the Savior of the rich and of the poor and he grew to be a fine lad in thought word and deed for his father in heaven said in him i am well pleased how i love to hear the story of Jesus, my Lord, every word is a comfort to me. And how I love to hear the story of Jesus without his story. There'd be no hope for me. He was the greatest of all teachers, and he showed us the way. Not a word went unanswered, not one soul was turned away. Yet he came for just one reason To be our sacrifice For God so loved us He sent his son to pay the price How I love to hear the story of Jesus my Lord, every word is a comfort to me. How I love to hear the story of Jesus. Without his story, there'd be no hope for me. Without his story, there'd be no hope for me. Well, as we turn again to First Peter, we... Uh, we see a change in Peter. Peter has spent uh, uh, the first uh, several verses laying out what a great salvation. Last week we went in great detail over the great salvation that we have in Christ. And because of that, we have a great hope that will endure through our difficulties and our sufferings and our trials and our disappointments. Uh, and because of this, uh, we have hope, an enduring hope. Uh, because we have faith, a genuine faith. We have a hope that will endure to the end. Uh, we're reminded in Peter that uh, our trials are temporal, that what we're going through, this exile, this disappointment, our struggles are just temporal, and ultimately uh, God will uh, prevail and God will bring grace, and we will ultimately, at the coming of Jesus Christ, uh, uh, we will be restored in all the glory that God intended from the very foundation of the world. And because of that great salvation, uh, now Peter turns, and uh, this great salvation should cause us to live differently. 
And now we come to the practical side of it. And uh, Peter wants to encourage uh, uh, these people who are being persecuted and going through this trial uh, that in spite of what we're going through, uh, that the time is to live differently, to live, uh, we're going to talk about living in hope. He's going to encourage and challenge them to live in hope of uh, Christ's coming. Uh, second, number two, he's going to encourage them to live in holiness, that they are to live in holy conduct, that how they live matters. And lastly, uh, in light of a future judgment, uh, they are to live in holy reverence or holy fear in God. And so Peter is going to lay out these three points in the next couple of verses. And, and so as we begin to do that, uh, I was thinking, uh, uh, we have not talked about the, the Hermitage Conference. Uh, in fact, um, I, I, I spoke with Jeremy Hofstetter last night, and, and we had a little conversation. And uh, I realized that I had not been in God's church with God's people since Hermitage. That's the last time that we, uh, we were in worship with God's people. And uh, we really haven't talked about that. And uh, we had several kids that went. And, and uh, I just want to share a little bit from that conference as I, as I kick off today. Number one, the, uh, the conference uh, was about awake. That was the title of the conference and the idea is that our time is short. Uh, and uh, because of that, we need to wake from our slumber and we need to be diligent about the things that God has called us to do. And so during this conference, there came a point in time on Saturday evening uh, as uh, uh, they were in the song service before the preaching was to begin uh, and the Spirit of God was moving and this young man stood up. He came up during the normal worship service. His youth pastor was the drummer. He came up. He he went around, we thought maybe he was going to the bathroom, he goes around the altar, he comes up to the drummer, and he grabs him, and he indicates that he needs to get right. And they come to an altar of prayer during the worship service, and this young man gives his heart to Christ. Well, as he's given his heart to Christ, uh, then his friends become to come, and then another one comes, and another one comes, and before we know it, in the next few minutes, uh, the altar is filled with children that are coming to Christ. There was an awaking moment during that conference. Um, and then the pastor came up and it became evident that this uh, metaphor came out of the conference that it's the fourth quarter. We're at the end of the game. And so uh, as we came home energized from that conference, it's been a little disappointing come back and not being able to meet with our kids and not being able to, to, to build upon that. And I have pondered over the last five weeks uh, uh, that conference and this idea, this fourth quarter just keeps popping back in my mind. And I began to pray and ponder and think about these things. And uh, I've kind of come to this conclusion. Um, my prayer is that it is, it is what God is doing. Uh, I'm wondering if this is this pandemic, this uh, coronavirus, if it isn't God's time out. Now, let me explain to you. Um, I used to coach basketball for about 10 years. Uh, played basketball all the way through uh, junior high and high school. Loved the game. I loved the sport. I loved the game of basketball. I loved to coach it. And uh, when you come to the fourth quarter, the game changes. It doesn't matter what's happened in the past. It doesn't matter how the first three quarters went. If you're in the fourth quarter, uh, you have this sense of urgency knowing that the game ha is intimately going to be over. You can see on the clock, we, this is it. There isn't another quarter after this. There isn't another re restart. This is it. And uh, every time in the fourth quarter, there comes a moment in the fourth quarter where a good coach will call a timeout. He'll, he'll signal the timeout, and the, the referee will, will blow the whistle, and the time will stop on the clock, and you'll have a moment in which the, the clock's not running, and it's given so that the teams can come over to the side and they, they huddle up and they get instruction. And as a coach, some of the things that I would do, uh, first of all, I would always, there's always be a time of rebuking and correction. If need be, reminding them of the fundamentals. Usually had to do on defense or blocking out. Uh, because they're getting the boards. And so uh, there's always a time where we remind those that are on the field uh, that there's a proper way to play and that uh, we are to go back to the fundamentals and correct the way we've been living or the way we've been acting or the way we've been uh, playing the game. Uh, it's also a time uh, to catch one's breath. 
uh, usually in the, the fourth quarter, you're sucking air. Um, and uh, I knew when I did my practices, we would always run the killers at the end and have to make free throws to condition them for the fourth quarter. But regardless of how much condition you're in, in the fourth quarter, you're sucking air. And a timeout is good to just <sighs> catch our breath. We get caught in the busyness of the moment that we need a timeout to just catch our breath, to refocus our attention. Uh, it also is the time in which the coach lays out a plan. He might call a plan. He may change the defense. He may run a special offense. He may notice something that needs to change on the field. And he changed the strategy maybe or changed the game plan uh, as our final push to victory. Uh, I see that in Scripture that we are reminded over and over of God's plan, God's mission, God's purpose. Uh, sometimes it's just uh, to remind us to, to run the play. And, uh, and so I've been reminded during this time that what matters is the mission, and that is to go make disciples, to go evangelize the lost, to go uh, build, uh, to preach and teach the Word and draw men to Christ. And then lastly, and I think this is probably where we are, and, and uh, is lastly when we come at the end of the huddle, my, my goal was always to, regardless of where we are, to exhort them to encourage them, to pick them up, uh, and to give them the challenge that the game is on the line. And we don't play the game in the timeout. We don't play the game on the bench. The game is played on the floor, in the field. And uh, when the timeout is over, it's time to go put into play all that we've talked about. And that each individual has a role to play. We can't all be quarterbacks, we can't all be running backs, we can't all be point guards, we can't all be centers. Every individual on the team has a role to play. And if we are successful, it is because we have all done our role and we've come together as a team that we're no longer I, but we are His. And we come together that way. And that we leave it on the floor. We play without reservation. We don't hold back. Uh, we go for every loose ball. We, we're not concerned about our well-being. We'll give up a, a floor burn for the sake of the ball, so to speak, and to, and to play with abandonment to our own well-being for the sake of the victory. And this is the idea that I think, uh, I think that's where we are. My hope is in Peter because I think this is what Peter's doing. I think this is what Peter has done in this text. He's called a little time out, and he wants to remind uh, uh, the church of, uh, that uh, we're in the last quarter. And yes, we're tired, and yes, we're weary, and yes, we're burdened, uh, and yes, we have floor burns, and yes, we have bruises, and yes, we've sweated, and yes, we've done, but we haven't given it all yet. And so let's play through to the end. Let's Let's not slow up. Let's not slow down. Let's not uh, uh, be distracted uh, by the crowd. Let's not be distracted by the cheerleaders over there. But let us focus on the course that's set before us and let us run with endurance. And, and, and I believe that's what Peter is doing. And so as we come to our text today and as we look at those things, I believe that's what Peter is doing. And I believe that's what God is saying to us during this time that we have this break and we have an opportunity to refocus our attention. So with that, uh, would you turn with me to 1 Peter uh, chapter 1? And I want to start with our first point, uh, that we are to live in a living hope. Our lives should be different. And one way we're to live differently than the world is that we live with expectation of hope. And so we begin in 1 Peter there. Therefore, prepare your minds for action, and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. And so this is our first point. Uh, first of all, Peter's saying, wake up. It is time to get out of your sleep. It is time uh, to be prepared. Uh, and this preparation is is intentional. Watch what he says. Some of your texts, if you're in the King James, the New King James, it says, gird up the loins of your mind. Uh, and the idea here is in a Roman soldier, everybody would have saw in a Roman soldier or someone who was going to prepare to run uh, the dress and the garb that they wore at that time uh, was a long garment and they would wear a belt. 
and that kind of hold it all together. And if you got prepared to run or prepared for battle, you didn't want to, to, to leave uh, uh, the shirt tails, so to speak, or your skirt tails, so to speak, uh, out and get encumbered uh, and get caught up, and then you fall and you're at a weakened condition. So the idea here was what they would do is they would take uh, the tails of their garments and they would roll it up and they would stick it into their belt. And the idea here is now that they're not encumbered they're not uh, going to get caught up with their skirt, uh, uh, but now they can move freely and they can advance. Uh, and so this idea of preparation, it's done with intentionality. It just doesn't happen on its own. It's this idea that we are seeing uh, that there is work ahead. It's not the time to slumber. It's not the time to be lazy. It's not the time uh, uh, to lay on the couch, but it is time to get up. It is the time to wake up. It's time to focus on what's ahead of us, and we must prepare, and we must prepare our minds. See, the battle is won in our minds. For how we think will determine how we live, how we act, how we function. And Peter is concerned about how they live. As, are they living differently? And if they're going to live differently, they're going to have to change the way they think. And they need to be prepared in doing so. And so he's asking them, number one, to be intentional. Uh, number two, uh, to be sober-minded, not to be distracted uh, by the cares of this world, by the distractions of this world. This idea is don't be caught under the, uh, the rule of, of, of wine or strong drink drink or some other drug or some other influence, uh, but rather uh, be uh, thinking soberly, clearly, and uh, to not be distracted. Because when we do that, our actions will change. I am reminded of uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul is writing to the church at Rome, and he says, do not be conformed to this world. This system, this thought process, uh, the actions of this world, the, the way this world lives is under the dominion and reign of, of Satan. He is the God of this world. He is the God of this age. And he has blinded, the Bible says, uh, the minds of this world. He is in charge of it. And so the music and the movies and the literature and all the entertainment is driven by him and by a worldly attitude and a humanistic attitude. And so what Paul has addressed to the Roman church that's exactly what Peter is addressing here. Don't be like them. Don't think like them. Don't be conformed by their thinking, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It is the beginning. We are, our, our life is changed by the way we think and by the renewal of our mind and by testing, you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. And we know that how we think matters. And so God's word, it's, it's, it's crucial that we get God's word. This is God's thoughts. This is God's, uh, what, he, what he says to us, what he speaks to us. Uh, to have the mind of Christ is to have this word hidden in our hearts that we might not sin against him. Uh, David uh, reminds us that this word is a light into our paths. Uh, how does a young man keep him way, his way pure? By taking this word, these precepts, uh, and hide them in our heart uh, and uh, not just hear them, but to be doers of the word. And we're going to talk about that a little later. And so we have to, uh, while we're in this time where we're not in our normal activities, uh, many of you, maybe not all of you, but many of you have extra time. And so what are you doing with that time? Are you, it's okay to take a nap. It's okay to take a walk. I would encourage you uh, with this time to go take some prayer walks, walk your neighborhood, uh, take your family out and, and enjoy God's creation. But at the same time, be mindful of our neighbors and our loved ones who are lost, who do not know Christ and be prayerful for them. But also take some time every day to spend in God's word. I would encourage you, especially read the gospel, see what Jesus did and what he taught and what he said and the hope that we have uh, and focus on these things and they will change the way you think. And because it'll change the way you think, it'll change the way you live. And so I would encourage you to do that. Also, he says a key to this hope is to set our hope on the coming at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That grace that will be brought to us and that grace of our salvation will occur when Jesus comes again, when he comes and sets up his glorious kingdom. And the idea here is, is that that is coming. 
Right now, we look at our circumstances, we look at our surroundings, and uh, it, it can be grievous. It is a trial, it's a difficulty. Uh, whether it be persecution, whether it be sickness, whether it be disappointment, whether it be this uh, uh, pandemic, uh, life right now is difficult. And he doesn't want us to lose hope. In fact, he says to set our hope. Uh, some of your text says, fix your hope. That means it's kind of like a target. Uh, it's this idea, uh, for those of you who are hunters, you go out there and you, you, you get him in your crosshairs and you fix that target on the deer. And this is the idea. You don't, you're, you're focused and you're targeted on Christ and the hope that is coming at the salvation at his coming. And so when we do that, we're not distracted by the cares of this world. I'm reminded uh, the example that we're given by the writer in Hebrews is that of Jesus, who endured the cross for the joy of bringing us to God. It's found in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that so clings to us closely. That's this idea of this encumbrance. Get rid of this stuff that's keeping us from following him. And let us run with endurance, with perseverance, uh, with patience, uh, the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy that was set before Jesus was this idea that he was going to bring me and you into the presence of a holy God and made peace with him. And that was the joy beyond the cross. And so he's asking us in the same way, look beyond our moment, our temporary. I want to remind you that what we're going through is temporal. It's only here for a moment. It will come to pass. It will pass away. But our salvation will be forever. So focus on what is to come, not necessarily what we're going through. Living in hope, and in living in hope, it will change the way we live. And lastly on this, he talks about being obedient children, as obedient children, not to be conformed to the passions of your formal ignorance. In other words, when we were, before we came to faith in Christ, we were characterized as the children of disobedience. Uh, we had no capacity of obedience. We did our own thing. We did exactly what we wanted to do. I'm reminded as a child, I was a rebellious child and I just want to do what I want to do. I didn't care what mom or dad said. The only time I submitted to them is because I didn't want to get caught. I didn't want to get disciplined. Uh, and if I had my own choice, I did my own thing. And that's that characterized us before Christ. When we were dead in our trespasses and sins, we were disobedient, and yet God has called us in this new life because of this great salvation. We have been born again of an incorruptible seed, an everlasting life. Because of this, we are to be obedient. We are to submit to the authority and the word of God. And here's the last point I want to make on this is, yes, we need to read it as it changes our mind, but unless we're obedient to God's word, it will, it will have no impact. Reading God's word will not change you, but obeying it will. It is when we take God's word and we're not just a hearer of God's word, but we are a doer of God's word. That's when it changes how we live. That's when people begin to notice. That's when they see our good works and then they will glorify our father, which is in heaven. Let's move on to the second point, And that is living in holiness. Uh, it is found there uh, in verse 15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. That was found in Leviticus 11.44. It says, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourself. Set yourself apart. Be holy, for I am holy. We are commanded to be holy. This is not a suggestion. This is not something that God is saying, well, you can take it or you can leave it. You can decide if you want to be holy or not. He has commanded us to be holy because he's holy. And this idea of holiness is that we are set apart. We're not like everything else. We are different. We are to look, it's, 
It's like we go back to uh, the Old Testament. We see the Nazarite vow that was placed in the book of Leviticus. And we've had a couple of those. John the Baptist, we've been studying in our Sunday school lesson. He was a Nazarite unto the Lord. Uh, and they were not to, uh, number one, they were not to, to eat anything of the fruit of the vine. They were not to drink any strong drink. They were not to, uh, uh, in fact, I have taken the Nazarite vow, I think, uh, over this period of time. There's no cutting of the hair. And so, as you can see, each week, uh, the fro is beginning to grow. And so, uh, part of the reason for that is uh, uh, when they saw this prophet, this guy who had a Nazarite vow to the Lord, he looked different because he was different. Samuel was a Nazarite. And, and John the Baptist, when they saw him, they noticed he looked different. He, he, acted, he went to the wilderness. He wore a different clothing. He ate differently. The idea was, is that he's not like everybody else. He is set apart. He's consecrated for the use of God. God is holy because he's unlike anything else. God is holy because he's pure. He's above all. He's indescribable, but he's filled with glory. He's filled with goodness. He is, the, he is what righteousness is. He is what purity is. He, God is love, the Bible says, in the purest form of it. There is nothing unholy about him. There's nothing unclean about him. There's no evil in him. He is the essence of righteousness and goodness. And because he is holy, here's the interesting part, he has called us out of sin to be holy. That's an interesting verse 15. But as he who called you, he's commanded you, he's called you to come out from among them and be separate. Our God is not approachable unless we are holy too. We all see out in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Leviticus, how that they had to be uh, ceremonial clean to be able to enter and to worship and to have a time to be in the presence of God. I'm reminded in Exodus chapter 3, we, we know the story, uh, the calling of Moses. Uh, Moses is in the wilderness. He is uh, tending the flock. And uh, the Bible says in Exodus 3, Verses 2 through 5, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame out of the midst of a bush. And the interesting thing, the bush was burning, but it wasn't being consumed. Uh, and so Moses got, God got his attention. Uh, he called him, just like he gets our attention. Uh, Moses is doing his own thing. He's sitting there uh, doing the work, and he notices something that's unusual, and it grabs his attention. He says, I'm going to go find out what this is about. And that's God's calling us. We are doing our own thing. We're dead in our trespasses and sin. And God quickens us. He gets our attention. He gets our, our focus. And we turn toward him. And we come to approach him just as Moses did. And what would have happened if Moses had got too close to God and God's holiness? Uh, he would have burned up. He would have been consumed just as we would have been. But look what the Lord says. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Uh, it's dirt. I want to remind you, uh, it was just dirt. It was gravel. It was mud. Uh, uh, there is nothing holy in it until the presence of God became evident. And I want you to understand what made the ground holy was God's presence. It's important that we see that. Uh, if we want to worship Him, uh, He is holy and we must be holy as well. If we want to have fellowship with Him, uh, if we want to walk with Him, uh, uh, we're going to need to be holy. We're going to need to be pure. We're going to need to be set apart. Uh, I also want you to see that God is the source of our holiness. I have no goodness in myself. I have no holiness of myself. Uh, the only holy thing that we have is what God has given us. Uh, and so I want to take you to Isaiah chapter 6, uh, another familiar scripture text. Uh, it is Isaiah in the, in the year that King Uzziah died. Uh, he saw the Lord high, lifted up, and sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train... Uh, or the glory of his robe filled the temple. 
Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, and two he covered this face, and two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Now these are the holy angels. These are the angels in the presence of God. And I want you to see this. Isaiah sees God in his temple, on his throne, in his glory, and he sees these angels that are holy, and even the holiness of the angels are covering themselves because they are in the presence of a holy God. They are covering their faces, they are covering their feet, and with two they're flying. And this is what they're saying one to another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the very foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. So these angels are singing this chorus back and forth. Uh, holy is the Lord. And the response is, he's holy. And you have this chorus of angels uh, and the, the attribute of God that's being attributed here is that he is high, he is lifted up, he is good, he is holy because Isaiah needs to see himself in comparison to the holiness of God and that is that he is not. He is not holy. And his response is, woe is me, for I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm undone. When we stand and we understand how holy God is, we come to the grips of the fact that we are undone. We are unholy. And we have a dilemma. We can't save ourselves. We have no goodness. We have no righteousness of ourselves. We have no way to approach God. And we are condemned in our unrighteousness. And I love what God does here. He makes the confession. He agrees with God he's unholy. He agrees with God he's unclean. He agrees he's in the presence of God and he is condemned. And yet, because his eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim, one of these angels, flew to him, having in his hand a burning coal that was taken with tongs from the altar, from God's altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. And this is wonderful. He says, Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And now Isaiah, who was not holy, has now become holy because God has given him his holiness. I want you to see that. I want you to see he's been atoned for sin because God was the one who reached out to him. And lastly, I want you to understand we are holy in response to that gift of eternal life because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. Talking about that ground that was holy because of God's presence. Now we are holy because God, in, when we come to faith in Christ, God gave us his spirit and he lives inside of us. Uh, uh, that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. It says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God with your body. This idea that uh, this body that we have, even though it's fleshly, even though it desires the things of this world, even though it desires the appetites of this world, when we come to faith in Christ, we are given a down payment of the assurance of salvation by the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, it is given full. All of it is given to us at the, sa at the time that we have believed, and now the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. Uh, and the Scripture says Paul encourages the the church at Galatians to be filled by the Spirit. In other words, come under control and rule and reign of the Holy Spirit that you might not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Yes, my body wants to do the things of this world, but the Spirit of God who lives in me, which is holy, desires to please God and to walk with God and to be holy, to be separate, to be different. And yet, I have to be subject to it. I have to submit to it. And that brings us to our last point, uh, and that is living in holy fear. If you have your Bibles again, let's turn to 1 Peter, and let's look at verse number 17. And if you call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Uh, we come to this uh, idea of living in holy fear. We are to live in honor of God and reverence to God. He is worthy of that. And so first we see that he is our father. God is our father. Uh, Paul writing to the church at Galatians says, and because you are sons... 
God has sent the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That's a term of endearment. In the Greek, that Abba means Daddy. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. We need to understand that God is one. We've been asked by Jesus to approach him as father. That was one of the reasons when he prayed, when the disciples came and said, teach us to pray, he begins, our father, which art in heaven. They have never prayed to God that way. They never saw God as their daddy, as their father, as their provider, as a son does to a father. And so we need to understand that he is our father and he's good. But also we need to understand that every father, Father who is good disciplines his children and God will discipline us. One reason why we need to live in holy fear and reverence and honor to our heavenly father is because he wants us to be holy. And if we're not, he's going to discipline us. In fact, uh, the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 12, verses seven through 11, it is for discipline that you have to endure. Why? Because God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, then which we have all participated in, then are you illegitimate children and not sons? Besides this, we have have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not more be subject to the father's spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best for us. To them, but he disciplines us for our own good that we may share his holiness, to be like him. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So we have this principle that if we are not living in, in, in step with the Holy Spirit and, and living a life of holiness and separation, that God is concerned about that and he'll discipline us if we're his. If we're not disciplined, uh, uh, we're not his children. And here's the principle that we get in. Uh, as Christians, we can, we can come to faith in Christ and we can have eternal life, but we can live like the devil. We can, we can live exactly the way we want to because we do have choice in that. We can deny the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. We can grieve it. We can do our own things. And here's the, the proof of Scripture. Uh, David was a man after God's own heart. David was a, uh, had the testimony of the scripture that he desired the things of God, that he loved God. He wrote most of the Psalms. He wrote these great Psalms of praise to our God and King. And yet we see the depravity of David's heart by choice. He became a peeping Tom. He was supposed to go out to war at the time of the Kings uh, and he chose not to be. He chose to be lazy. He's sitting at home. He's in his palace. He looks across uh, uh, the street and he beholds Bathsheba taking a bath and he becomes enamored with her. He begins, his mind takes over. He begins to pursue it. Uh, I believe he rapes her. I believe she had no choice. A king calls her to come and she comes and he has his way with her. And then he tries to cover it up. Uh, uh, He tries to lie about it. And then ultimately, and this is the amazing thing to me, Uh, Bathsheba, he would have most likely been at the wedding of Uriah, who was one of his mighty men, who was one of the men who came to him in the cave of Adullam, who followed David, who was trained by David, who loved David, and David loved them. Most likely, uh, David would have been at the ceremony when Uriah and Bathsheba were wed. And so this is unbelievable that he does this. He's God's man. There's no doubt in our mind he is the chosen king. He's the anointed one. Through his seed, the Messiah would come. Uh, We have that prophesied. We have that declared in Scripture. And yet, he chose to act like an unregenerated man and cover up sin. And he spends about 18 months in this. He has Uriah killed on the battlefield. He murders him in cold blood. It was intentional. It was premeditated. There was no excuse. And yet we see he doesn't repent for a period of time. But because God is rich in mercy, he's not going to leave David that way. His desire for David is to be a man after his heart and to live like it. To live as one who follows him. Why? Because he is to reflect God's glory. 
He is to testify of God's goodness as the king. He is to point to the glory of God. And right now he's not doing that. He's pointing to himself. He's pointing to his worldliness. He's doing what he wants to do. But God raises up a prophet in Nathan and he sends Nathan down to the house of David. And Nathan comes knocking on the door and David opens it and it's God's man. And I'm sure David wasn't happy to see him. And Nathan gets his attention by telling him this story about one who had many lambs, uh, and he stole the one who did not have any. And it made David angry because of the injustice. And then Nathan turned around and said, and David, you are that man. Why does God do that? Because God loves David. And so he brings David to the reconciliation to realize that he is, he is sinning. He's outside the will of God. And so David's first step is confession. He agrees with God that he sinned. And number two, we see repentance. We see the repentance as we saw in Psalms 51, his glorious psalm of repentance where he asked that God would create a clean heart in him, a pure heart. But there's also a consequence and because of this sin, uh, we see Absalom, his son, rebels. We see uh, uh, his son, uh, uh, who was conceived in adultery, uh, is taken. And so David suffers discipline at God so that he might yield the fruit of righteousness. Same way with us. You can sin, uh, but as a Christian, you can't get by with sin. You'll be miserable. And so the thing that I have learned in my own life, because God has taken me to the woodshed, I have scars of disobedience in my past uh, walk. I was saved at the age of eight, but I haven't walked uh, completely obedient with him all these days. And I have found through many trials and through many difficulties and through many times of discipline, because I was full of rebellion, God breaks it so that we can be his obedient children glorifying him. And that's the best way to live. And I would rather live in obedience to him than live one day in disobedience. And lastly, it brings us that God is our judge and is worthy of reverence. He is worthy to be held in high regard. He's God. He's the creator. He's holy. And he's going to judge us. And, and I think some of us uh, don't understand even that he's, Peter is talking to the church. He's talking to believers. He's not talking to the lost person. He's not, this letter is not addressed to those who don't know Christ. And so we all understand that we will all stand before the great white throne of God, the, the final judgment, but that's not what Peter's talking about here. He's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. He's talking about this idea that every believer will stand before Jesus and give an account of what kind of Christian we were whether we are going to be rewarded for our faithful life or will we suffer loss. And so I want to take you, if you have your Bibles, and this will be where we end today, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to be in verses 10 through 17. Uh, this is where we find uh, the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, Paul is addressing the church at Corinthians. Uh, the church at Corinthians is a carnal church, uh, is a church of believers, uh, uh, but they're so caught up in sin, uh, um, even so much that uh, uh, there's incest and adultery and drunkenness and orgies and all these things that, that shouldn't be a part of the kingdom of God. And so he, he writes to them in verse 10, according to the grace of God given me like a skillful master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation, and we're going to see that, that's our works, our lives. Uh, uh, we can either build with gold silver, precious stones, or hay, wood, and straw. Each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and fire will test what sort of work each one has done. And so we see at that day, that day that we're going to stand before Jesus, uh, uh, it will be tested. Our works will be tested by fire. How we lived on this earth will matter. We will either gain reward in obedience or we will gain a loss through our disobedience. And he said our works are either going to be gold and silver and precious stones, which are precious. And all of those things when tested with fire remain. You take gold and heat it up with fire and it produced pure gold. 
You take silver and you apply the fire and it purifies the silver. Precious stones are made under the heat. You know, a diamond is nothing more than coal, graphite under tremendous pressure and heat, and it produces a gem, a diamond of precious. So the trials and the difficulties in our lives as Christians produce good things, good works. But the hay, the wood, and the stubble, the straw, those things, uh, when tested by fire, they're burnt up. There's nothing remains. It's nothing but ash and it's destroyed. And that's what he's saying. Each one's work will be made manifest. It will be revealed in that day, tested by fire. What have we done for Christ? Some of you, I, 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 you have been saved since you were a young man or a young woman, and you've done nothing for the kingdom of God. You've not been obedient to him in any place in your life. Uh, uh, you haven't tithed. Uh, you haven't given of your time. Uh, you haven't given of your effort. You won't even crack his book open. You won't even come to the house of God. You've never served in the kingdom of God, and yet you're saved, uh, but you've lived a selfish life all on yourself. Uh, and yet Paul, his testified is the life I live is not my own, but it's unto Christ. He bought me. I've been crucified with him. And I am going to live a life of honor for him. And so we need to understand that because there's a judgment to come, we should look at how I'm living today. It's an imminent judgment. You won't escape it. Uh, you will be saved, but you'll suffer loss. But for those who have lived a life of obedience and a life of differently on this earth, it will bring glory and honor to God and we will have reward. And lastly, I want you to understand as we come to a close, he says in our text, during your time of exile. That's now, that's where we're living. And I want you to understand that this time matters. Yes, it's a difficult time, as it was for the, uh, the people in Peter's day. They were going through difficulty. Uh, they were living in a time of distraction, maybe hiding for their lives. And a lot of times when we get in this time of exile, we think it's all about us. We conserve ourselves. We're, we're hiding because we're fearful. And yet, Peter wants to encourage us to live, number one, in hope, to live in holiness, and to live in holy fear, because our time matters and how we live matters. So as we come to a close today, I want to challenge you. I don't know where you are. I don't know where your life is. Number one, if you do not know Jesus in the free pardon of sin, you can know him today. He offers eternal life to whosoever will come. And if your heart has been pricked, uh, uh, repent of your unrighteousness and ask for Jesus to save you and to be Lord of your life, trusting in him, casting all of yourself upon him, and he will gloriously save you. That's his promise. That's the good news. That's the gospel. And then maybe for you believers, maybe you need to evaluate how you're living. Because how we live matters. And are we testifying of his goodness and his holiness are we demonstrating Christ's likeness to our neighbors? They will not come to Christ unless they see it in us. And we are the gospel in our witness in how we live. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege. We ask that you would take this word, that we use it for your glory. We ask that if there's one who doesn't know you in the free part of sin, that they come today before it's too late and give themselves to you. And Lord, for that one who's disobedient, I pray that you have convicted them and that they would repent. Lord, we do pray for revival, and we realize revival will not come unless we repent of the sins that we're living in. May we come clean. May we be holy because you're holy. We ask all of this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night then through the darkness, your loving kindness.
torn through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, and Jesus Christ, you're my living hope. Sing it with us. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, sing it out. It's grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Then came the morning That sealed the promise Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me sing it again sing it with us then came the morning then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me jesus yours is the victory on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope hallelujah he's the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me in every chain there's salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living hope Jesus Christ 